Well, it's a beautiful Monday morning here in Lagos, Nigeria. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily, coming to you live on Channels Television. I'm Coyote Okikiolu, but I'm not alone, right? The morning even gets beautiful, if it's anything like that. I'm being joined by what? Chamberlain. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome along to Sunrise Daily today. Yeah, it is good to be back. Oh, yeah. And, um, and that smile on your face just tells a lot because we've been getting mails, messages, calls. Where is Chamberlain? Well, here he is. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate everyone oh, yeah. who really did put out a word there. So it's, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much indeed. I'm you, glad about that. You know, I, I, I was fighting the urge to jump on Chamberlain this morning. I mean, just to show how excited I was. I mean, COVID and the rest. But what you're seeing on the screen right now is a yeah. downer for a lot of people. Well, so there are two sides to the story. What you have right there is a number of uh, registered, licensed tertiary institutions in Nigeria. So we have 45 federal universities, 52 state universities, 99 private universities, 12 approved distance learning centers, and 15 affiliated universities. And just recently, a few months ago, the NUC actually compiled a list of unlicensed tertiary institutions. And yeah. our correspondent followed up just to get a sense of you know, this anomaly, really, it is a big challenge. And, and let me just paint a picture. So you have people, you have parents first who say they want their children to get, you know, better education. So they enroll them in these schools. Some of these schools, they have to write examinations. They have to tender certificates and the rest. And, of course, they have to pay sometimes yeah. more than you probably find in federal universities and the rest. So, I mean, the parents go through this whole stress. The children also go through the stress, or the students, as the case may be, they go through this whole process, and first year in, second year in, and then they get notification that this tertiary institution is unlicensed. Now, it's unquestionable to have people actually perpetrating these sort of illicit, illegal, unfair acts. I mean... Imagine people investing their lives into school for years and then they just get a sense that all that has been wasted. And, you know, Emperor Simon, our correspondent, went around and noticed some of these schools and, you know, seeing the students wailing and the yeah. rest, it, it, it's really sad. You know, it, it's, um, again, of course, it's systemic. But, you know, I think I remember some time ago, uh, you know, in school, and at that time, even for the registered ones, the federal universities, remember those, uh, I don't know what to call the big five. <laughs> I don't know, Premier League, they have those big four. But that's what they are, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even in some of those schools, mm. uh, and when they tell you NUC was coming to accredit some courses and all of that, you have students who are already enrolled, yeah. and then they're in the second and third year, and sometimes that's when they tell you that, well, this course has not been accredited. So you have that kind of challenge. So much as, yes, it's sometimes you don't even understand how we have some of these institutions that are quote-unquote illegal, unregistered, and then the fleecing students are actually there studying. So it, it points to a huge gap, yeah. a huge need, because if you look at the stats, I think if I remember properly, um, the NBS released a, do a, a data, and then I think between 2010 and 2015, they said that... Um, 26% uh, of students who apply to tertiary institutions uh, were the ones that got admission. No, 26%, yeah. Out of the, all of those who apply, only 26%. So what happens to the other 24? People wow. want to get certain things. And you know here, we play, pay a lot of attention to uh, what paper qualification as opposed the to the skills that people have. Is it commercial or what they tender? Mm -hmm. So that imbalance is there. And you have students who apply to do jam at the end of the day the system has changed they don't get in what did they do interesting you mentioned that because in 2019 about two million and thereabouts actually wrote the utme and eventually yeah. just to buttress that point only one out of three got admission and i mean we, we went through that list just to paint a picture of how much tertiary institutions we have in nigeria mm -hmm. imagine two million students jostling to get into how many just about 300 or 400 
or thereabouts of these tertiary institutions. So there's a huge gap. It is wrong, definitely, to have people uh, setting up unlicensed tertiary institutions Absolutely. and the rest. But it points to the bigger challenge, which is a huge gap. What happens? So imagine 600,000. In fact, universities has to go more than you know the the, the, the capacity they had. So they had 600,000. That was 2019. They took about 612,000 just to at least try to accommodate as much as possible. So what happens to the 1.4 million? that did not get into those tertiary institutions. I mean, even NUC did say in 2018 that 58 of those universities were illegal. Oh, dear. So you just wonder, how does that happen? So certainly there are gaps between both the regulator and those schools themselves. Mm -hmm. How did it grow to that number? So they're just things that are unfortunately, young people have actually graduated from those schools. I actually know someone who graduated from a school, uh, but this one was outside Nigeria, and then the challenge was getting to uh, go for youth service, and the mm -hmm. person found out the school is not even registered. Uh, well, the good thing, or at least I say the silver lining is the head of the NUC has been reappointed by the president, so at least this is something we should definitely look into. And, and like Chamberlain said, pay more attention to actually en ensuring that these students get the skills. Yeah. Certificate is good, but we need to ensure that those skills they get in school match what they face outside of school. Uncontrollable emotions, regret, frustration. My father go let alone. Mommy and my sister go in there. Are they graduate next year? Go go here say I know they graduate again. Deep inside me, I'm born honestly. This is the current mood of students of an institution in Nassau State said to be operating without an approval by the National Universities Commission. This signpost standing in Autaba Lefi area along Abuja Kefi Road signals the existence of the International Professional College of Administration, Science and Technology in Nigeria, said to be established in 2005. The physical structure of the school where the students receive lectures is located further away from the road. This is where courses for diploma, higher diploma, degree and postgraduate degree programs are run. There are more than 2,000 students, according to some students that we spoke to. They also told us that they run almost all the courses, including medical courses like nursing, science, laboratory, technology. They told us that we spend a year in this school, then our final year exam will be at Kotonou, that is St. Felicity University. Somewhere within the college, students are on rampage protesting against the management, having heard through reports in the media that the school has not been licensed to operate. It's frustrating for many of the students who say they have spent four years here paying fees for non-existing courses. Four years. I'm even scared of telling my parents. I don't even know where to start, start from. Our time has been wasted. Our resources, everything. The rector of the college is not available, but some of his staff debunk the claims that the college is fake. We are not operating illegally. They also deny that the school offers degree or postgraduate courses. We don't run BSc program here. They run all medical courses, biochemistry, med lab, nursing, public health and community health. It's only nursing. We are where we got access to some documents belonging to the college, which shows that it claims to run ordinary national diploma higher national diploma, degree and postgraduate programs in more than 50 courses. The National Universities Commission, however, says it is not aware of the existence of the institution. It is illegal. Any name that's not there. We, I, 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 I've told you and, I, and I'm repeating, we have not allowed any affiliation with any foreign institution to, to give degrees in Nigeria now. In May 2018, the commission published a list of 58 universities it tagged fake in the country. A list it has consistently been publishing in its bulletins. They keep shifting bases, keep shifting location. There was a time when in this Abuja, they were doing it in some primary or secondary schools over the weekend. That we stopped. In our curiosity to locate more unlicensed degree awarding institutions, we stumbled on this banner on the wall of a building in Duse area, Abuja. They have enrolled many students already. 
The process you have to open an email and you have to open and do some payment. In the face of desperation by many Nigerians to acquire university degrees, the tendency for people with criminal minds to exploit such desperation has become high, leaving many like these ones victims. One way, however, to be sure that one does not fall victim of unlicensed universities or degree awarding institutions, according to NUC, is to get the list of universities or affiliate institutions that have been accredited by the Commission to run degrees and postgraduate degrees. Currently, there are 45 federal universities, 52 state universities, 99 private universities, 12 approved distance learning centers, and 15 affiliated universities approved by the NUC, all of which are based in Nigeria. Emperor Simon, Channel Television News. All right, welcome back. Let's run you through some of the dailies here. Today we'll start with Vanguard newspaper Strike. Still talking about this. Why we refuse to sign MOU, ascribed to doctors, says government punishing doctors for its failures. Insists strike continues until all demands are met by government. FG will commence implementation of MOU today. So, um, that's yeah. what it is. Is the MOU a thing now? I thought they had issues with it. Okay. Well, you know how it can happen in this country sometimes. We seem to uh, glamorize some of these terms, uh, make a big deal, make a mountain out of a molehill in some cases because it appears to be uh, <laughs> many movements, no motion. Because we had MOUs. Oh, it changed to an MOA at some point, I think. And then the people said, look, what is MOA? Legally speaking, how does that compare with what they actually want? Oh, wow. But to still be talking about doctor strike at this stage, well, that's the big lead on the front page of uh, Vanga today, as you can see. But you've got several other headlines. But take a look at what's on the back page of Vanga today. World Athletics Under-20 Championships, in case uh, you may not have paid a lot of attention to it. Team Nigeria finishes third with four gold medals. So, there you go. Um, you know, we like, I mean, there's always a future, so you just hope that um, we'll be able to transit from here to the biggest stage. I think we usually have that challenge yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, cadet levels, all those championships at that level, we never seem to take it that step further. But that's Vanguard today. Well, for the Daily Trust, uh, the big one is also on the doctor's strike. Doctors in mass exodus amidst NARD strike. So that just paints a, I mean, it gives you a wider view of what's playing out here. So there's strike for of resident doctors, right? But in the midst of that strike, Nigeria is losing doctors. So imagine when that strike is called off. Clearly with this, we're not going to have the same strength we had before that strike. But take a look at the riders. Less than 40,000 doctors serving 200 million Nigerians. You know, we just talked about the education sector, how we don't have enough tertiary institutions. And by the way, during the math, there's just about 200 of them, not even as much as 300 or 400, serving, you know, millions of young Nigerians. And you see this one as well. My facilities stripped of personnel, CMD cries out. FG Schultz develop emergency intervention. NMA, act fast. Experts urge government, others, and, and I mean, we've seen some of those meetings, some of those deliberations, and the question is, is that the definition of fast? Is there some sort of urgency in all of that? Let us know your thoughts. I mean, it's a big conversation for us as well this morning, pages five and six mm -hmm. of the Daily Trust. And the big picture on the front page is, uh, uh, it shows an entertainer performing during a luncheon as part of the wedding ceremony of Yusuf Buhari and Zara Bayero in Abuja. That was yesterday. And under that, you see bandits release 15 more students of Bethel School. Mixed feeling of sorts because you find out that there are scores more students still in captivity. But good news nonetheless. And just one more. Politics. Anxiety as Secundus rejects October deadline. It's on PDP crisis. It's funny that when you ask the politicians, 
about the crisis. They tell you, nah, there's no crisis in the party. <laughs> and yet again, you see clearly that there are issues. So it's a page 33 read, PDP crisis there for you. That's the Daily Trust. Why does it look as if sometimes they can take that same kind of attitude mm. to national issues? You know, just playing the ostrich. So nah, there's no problem. But right there, you could clearly see with the stats showing us that, that you have a challenge, a challenge that we need to address. Well, take a look at New Telegraph. That's the next one we've got for you here. Concern mounts over rising POS fraud. Yeah, that's what New Telegraph is reporting here this morning, if we've got that one. Uh, okay, well, if we don't, we <laughs> might as well take uh, what are the ones that we've got. Okay, let's get the Guardian then. Uh, we've got the Guardian here today as well. Uh, it's a different matter here. Autumn Ohaneze fallen a kick over unknown grazing routes. So you see how I like to glamorize some of those words from unknown. Remember the days of unknown soldier, unknown gunman, now unknown grazing routes. So there you go. Wow. Um, I mean, many usually ask that, do we actually like the truth? Do we tell ourselves the truth? Are we realistic in some of these things? So um, look at the writer. Benway governor threatens legal action against Bari. And then you see ranching. FG should allocate six point two five billion naira to other states. Falana. Your oh. groups, analysts say FG's move an invitation to war anarchy. Farmers say FG should procure land for all, not only herders. You know, ever since the president spoke about the grazing routes, uh, I think it was a few months back and you know, it seemed as though he said he was going to speak to the Attorney General, or he had spoken to the Attorney General, I yeah. think, at that time. And so people thought, what is this about? And now, grazing reserves, mm. grazing routes, grazing reserves. But the point is, states have their plans already, as it were. So is this going to be the federal government trying to veto what states have, especially because a lot of states, I mean, Rivers just last week signed the anti-open grazing law. So a lot of states have these laws already on ground. So. Are we heading for an impasse or a full-blown conflict between the federal government and states? Because it's a federal system. The federating units have got the legal positions, legal capacities to do what they had to do. Because don't forget, they, the governors were equally elected by the people. Absolutely. So they've got a mandate of the people. So who knows? Uh, and then just at the bottom strip there, why CBN's $50 billion intervention fails to rally confidence in stock market. Foreigners shun market over dividend repatriation anxieties. Share prices stagnate as poor valuation fails to attract investor. Operators task government on fiscal policies to reverse trends. So you've got a lot of all of that if you want to take a look at it. That's Vanguard. Sorry, The Guardian today. Well, take a look at uh, Niger News Direct. See what the paper leads with today. And it's on ease of doing business. State revenue agencies engage thugs for multiple levies collection. Ugh. So what, are, they, are they staff of the state governments now? Do they have... Oh, gosh. You see, as APBN members protest multiple taxes at Delta, government must exercise caution in overtaxing masses. That's according to experts. Recall the vice president spoke about uh, taxation as responsible for the mortality we're seeing amongst SMEs or MSMEs, as the case may be. Now, you see state revenue agencies engaging thugs, not just for levies collection, multiple levies collection, I, I mean... I don't know what this says, but let us know what your experience has been. I know a lot of businesses have told me about their experiences, but let's know. You can send us a mail on our email. There you go. That's a big one for the News Direct. There's also the one from NDLEA season 2,504.8 kilograms of drugs in five states. It's like the NDLEA is on steroids, as they say. Pun intended, clearly. <laughs> That's Nigerian News Direct. Okay, take a look at leadership newspaper here today. And then the, uh, the theme has got to be seven weeks after. And then you see 65 Bethel students still in captivity as 15 regain freedom. So that's what you see um, on the front page of leadership newspaper here today. So talking about security and the challenges that we'll face. And... Um, it turns out that there are several questions about some of these things. Um, I mean, 
I don't know if there's been any recent briefing by the security agencies or police concerning who and who has been arrested of all of these bandits mm. because they do these things time and again just because they can. And when you see that now, the families are the ones... Bearing the brunt pain. Yeah, in actually. charge of even negotiations, as it were. I mean, you have state government saying, this is our stance, no negotiation. We're not negotiating with bandits. But, you know, the families say... <laughs> But these are our people. As much as we respect your stance, we need to ensure that our people are safe. So, here people paying millions of ransom, and it just appears as though uh, the government is quiet in that area. And you have governments also telling people to protect themselves. So, it's, it's really a lot. But uh, let's see the new telegraph. But before that, let's take the uh, Abuja Inquirer for you this morning, just to give you a sense of what's happening in the nation's capital, Abuja. So let's see the Abuja Inquirer. Okay. All right, we'll move on from that. Uh, guys, the new telegraph. Let's see if we have that at least. I, I recall that Chamberlain mentioned the new <laughs> telegraph earlier on. So at least let's Maybe see what's... Time lucky this oh, time. yeah, let's hope that. Let's see what's on the front page of the new telegraph. But I'll tell you, uh, in the meantime, concern mounts over rising POS fraud. Yep as Yahoo boys now operate as agents. Oh yes, that's the new telegraph for you. But take a look at what experts are saying. Make use of ATMs. Now I have a challenge with this. So we talk about financial inclusion. And from what we've seen so far, those POS agents penetrate places where you don't have ATMs. I mean, we know these things. ATMs are not everywhere. You don't have them in villages. You have people traveling kilometers just to get funds. So you have POS agents penetrating these places, ensuring they give people access to funds, even opening accounts, uh, you know, for these people. So uh, telling people now to use ATMs, people that are in villages, they have to fall back to these POS agents. I think we should face the issue, ensure that that area is sanitized. I know that banks and some of these fintechs provide uh, some of these checks and balances, but clearly this is still ongoing so we really really desire that this is sorted from the cbn to the dmbs to some of these agents as well super agents we call them super agents oh yeah that's the term <laughs> super agents uh, on top of the nameplate you see this oh, one right. about nigeria's debt to hit 38.4 trillion naira by year end it's always a big conversation around debt borrowing i mean it's it's a given we have to borrow as it were but people tell you do we really have to borrow well, like I said, it's a big, big debate. Just finally on the front page of a new telegraph, again, 16 killed, houses raised in southern Kaduna. That's a new telegraph for you. Well, well, well. That is it when we look at some of the dailies here today. We will be back in a moment. Stay with us if you can. All the people here are stakeholders in the health industry and health workers on this side and these are government side that have to do with uh, the issues raised and uh, we have uh, tackled the issues satisfactorily. The government side have put uh, their pen on paper to the MOU and also the NMA and uh, the associations comprising of uh, America and Data Council of Nigeria, uh, consultants, sorry, medical and uh, dental consultants of Nigeria, uh, NARD, resident doctors, and uh, the doctors in academics, it's about. not today with us to consult their members on uh, an item which they want uh, us to include in the conditions of the memorandum of understanding. The meeting did not discuss the issue of no work, no pay. We cannot. It's one of the things uh, in the industrial courts. It's one of the matters for resolution in the industrial courts.
Welcome back. Well, yes, indeed, we'll be talking about the uh, ongoing doctor strike. Well, to shed light on this matter, uh, Professor Innocent Uja, the president of Nigeria Medical Association, joins us from our studios in Abuja. Good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Um, could you tell us, because, I mean, there are conflicting reports in the dailies, and then having listened to the minister, many still try to piece together what really is going on. So from your perspective, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Where are we at the moment? Well, good morning, Chamberlain. Um, I'm delighted that I'm here. Let me first of all appreciate and thank Mr. President, who directed that all issues concerning the resident doctor strike must is resolved. And based on that directive, um, the Federal Ministry of Labor and other government agencies and the Nigerian Medical Association with its affiliates had two day meeting. The first was on Friday, couldn't conclude. And then we then extended it to Saturday, till very late in the night. So we had very, very robust um, discussion and each item was presented, resolved, and we went to the next one. So largely, as far as the Nigerian Medical Association is concerned, and also the affiliate, we all are, we agreed on all the 12 points, I think about 12 points, including the issue is not just resident doctors, also it includes, including the um, Medical and Data Consultant Association of Nigeria, and also the Association of Medical Doctor uh, Specialists in the Academics. Um, and it was that time for us to look at the details. We went into the details, did a lot of um, editing. Areas that were offensive or were not in agreement were removed. And um, we then were convinced that uh, if the government would um, do its own bit. Uh, it was good to go. And uh, that was at that point that we agreed that we must put a uh, pen to paper and then signed the documents. However, the only area of contention which the resident doctors um, were uh, not satisfied with was the issue of no work, no pay. Uh, that section uh, went um, to some... One of the things that we insisted and was put down was that no body, no, no body that took part in the strike was going to be um, victimized. So we, that was clearly, clearly stated and um, and based on that, we felt that in our own understanding and the ordinary meaning of uh, nobody will be victimized, the Nigerian Medical Association, Medical and Data Consultant Association of Nigeria, and uh, the Association of Medical Doc Specialists in uh, Academics went ahead to sign the document in the understanding that implementation will be complete that we will not be going forward and backwards because the problem we face usually is that when once um, memorandum of understanding or memorandum of action uh, is signed, everybody goes to sleep. And that is the problem. So there's uh, this distrust, you know, among workers, I mean, among the um, government uh, side. And this is not good for the country. It is not good for the country because we expect that those who work for our president should be honest, should be truthful, and should comply with their agreements. Because, I mean, 21 days of strike action for a country like this should not be heard by anybody. It's unacceptable. But the problem is that some people are not doing their work, and that is the truth. So many things are left undone. Otherwise, 
in my opinion, as the president of Nigerian Medical Association, this strike is avoidable. It's avoidable because in April, there was uh, the strike. We were able to convince um, uh, our colleagues, and they, they suspended the action, and nothing happened anymore. They gave a period of um, uh, notice to government. Again, nothing happened. And until they went on strike, even when they went on strike, nothing happened. Now, the, the, the reason why the NME had to intervene was the issue of the court. Once the federal government, and I thought that was a bit hasty, the federal minister of health did not, I don't think, did the right thing. I mean, going to court, and the court is now adjourned to 15th of September. That means there should be no work. Doctors should not go back. Resident doctors should not go back to work until the, the, the determination of the case. I felt that is hasty. There was well, no reason for that action at all. Well, Professor Oja, we'll, we'll talk about the court case. emergency situation. Uh, yeah, understandably. We'll talk about the court case and, of course, the implications. But still staying uh, on that meeting which you were a part of, uh, where we saw the, the minister speaking about Yes, did, uh, well, just before we came on the show, just right now. Uh, tell us, what were the details in the MOU that was signed? As you referenced, previously we had MOA, sometimes MOTOS, but this time it's an MOU, and mm -hmm. you signed it. What is in it? Well, it is difficult for me to, to give you one by one. There are about 12 items that um, we discussed, and they were all resolved, ranging from house officers, ranging from doctors who are, who, are in, who are in locum that will be migrated, ranging from doctor, the outstanding uh, consequential um, allowance or, or shortfall, as we call it. There are quite many. But we resolved all of them. I mean, that, that is the truth. Provided, provided the, the, the government will fulfill its uh, aspect of the, of, of the bargain. So when you uh, say so we... that was not an issue at all. As well, because, because at each stage, each one by one, we went through, discussed. Once it was satisfied, it then we, we, we then went to the other one. And, and we went one by one. And um, uh, it was a friendly uh, disposition. But the issue, I think the issue that is in contention is the issue of victimization. And okay. because of distrust, the resident doctors did not feel comfortable to sign the, the, the document. Okay, so um, when you say we resolved... Here, if they go, if they, if uh, we believe right. that if... Pardon me, let me just drop this. When you say we resolved all of them, so you're saying that, yes, there were issues that you agreed on, but still there were issues that were not agreed on? No, there was just one issue. The, the issue of victimization. That was the only thing left. Every other thing was thoroughly trashed out and agreed upon. But so what was, uh, what the... the yeah, the just a moment, Prof. Insisted. Now, again, following and, up on that we part of it, that, who are the we in this case? Is it NMA and government? Because, I mean, they are the given reasons why they didn't sign the MOU. No, I don't understand. Your NMA is not on strike. Enemy is not on strike. What enemy? Who, who signed the MOU? MOU? So, hello. Who signed the MOU in this case? No, no, no. The MOU is signed by so many groups: permanent secretary, head of service, permanent secretary, health, permanent secretary, labor, uh, MDCN. You know, it, it, and then on the side of the doctor, the enemy, the medical and data consultant Association of Nigeria the medical um, and dental specialists in academics. We all signed the, the MOU, except the resident doctors. So Who isn't that the... Strike. What the name is doing is intervention. Oh, okay. So now that uh, the resident doctors have not signed the MOU, they are insisting that the strike continues. Aren't they the ones that uh, were supposed to sign the MOU and end the strike? Or are those other agencies that signed it on strike as well? Well, the, 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 the reality is that 
the, the, M, the MOU was signed in an understanding that all aspects of the demand will be met. And as we talked now, nothing even has happened. What we have signed, uh, all we have done was to sign an, an MOU in the promise and in the understanding that the, go the government will um, fulfill its own side. And I'm sure they should because this is the order of the president. I don't think any other person can violate the order of the president. And I believe that the um, MDAs, member, the ministers, the, uh, the responsible officers, should implement um, the MOU. And um, so that, we, you know, the resident doctors can go back to work. Okay, uh, Professor Oja, this is like deja vu of some sort, because I recall March, April, we had this same conversation with you. In fact, an MOA, I believe, was signed at that time. And the question now is, it was signed, the strike resumed anyway, and that's where we are right now. So what is the value of an MOU, MOA, when after it is signed, the doctors eventually still go on strike? And I mean, I imagine that it was on the president's order at that time as well. So what is different this time around? Well, I, I, let me just say this, that um, if the MOU or MOA, as the case may be, uh, was signed and implemented. There, is no, there will be no reason for any... In fact, everybody should be doing a job. But the unfortunate thing is that once MOU and MA, MOA is, is signed, we all go to sleep. And that is the aspect that we want to appeal to Mr. President because it disrupts the system. Why is it that MOUs are signed and the responsible officers will not do their job. And that is the problem we face. So are we dealing with this problem? You know, Prof, are we uh, dealing with that particular into, into problem? Bad light. This problem you mentioned, are we dealing with it? Because if an MOA was signed and you said some people went to sleep, who are the people that went to sleep? Have they, are they awake right now? What was done as a result of those people <laughs> going to sleep? Really, are we addressing that problem? Well, uh, you see, I have no power of enforcement. All I have said is that people are not doing their jobs. And it's the responsibility of government to fish out those who are not doing their jobs and do the necessary. Because it is putting Nigeria in bad light. You sign an agreement, and you would, after that, that is the end of it. For instance, the issue of a, a, a residency training fund. Why has it not been released up to now? The, you will say this, the process is being on its own. The process is on from April to now. House officers, there were shortfalls. There were house officers that have not been paid. Seculars came out, and suddenly he, a, a, an NYC doctor is no longer a licensed doctor. Why can such a, a secular come out? Who should write such a letter? Um, that so he, how, in, an NYC doctor. Uh, he's, no longer, Soldier, he's no longer a doctor. Now that um, this MOU has been signed with all those uh, groups that you mentioned, how is this going to affect the NARD going back to work? Because they are insisting that the strike continues. Well, I, I think that what we need to do is to... Uh, is to interface with the, ministry, with the ministry, ministries of health and labor because they need to do the needful so that the resident doctors can, can, can call up the strike. And what is the needful in this to, case? To work. Now, the truth is, the issue is about distrust because you finish and you go back and nobody feels that anything has happened. I think that is what uh, we should appeal to the responsible officers to implement. Uh, oh. Even if what? all had not been done and there's a process there's evidence that there's a process of implementation i believe that the resident doctors will go to work so and did the the, the, did the nma no, no and did the nma and several other groups assigned the mou prevail or at least encourage the government to take off that case from court such that the doctors can then have that confidence to feel we're not being victimized or punished for what is going on but that was also discussed and that the process of a withdrawal uh, is on but you know these things are not done just one day 
the, the problem is the trust. You know, if we trust that the responsible officers will do their own bit, then there shouldn't be any problem. But why do we need, why do we have to be going forward and backwards? In a country as uh, well endowed as this, and unfortunately, as I'm talking to you, so many Nigerian doctors are leaving the country. And nobody appears to the Minister of Health. Yeah, uh, uh, me, Prof. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that that bit as we progress. But the um, the minister in the tape which we just heard before we began the conversation said that uh, that bit was not discussed. But you were saying that that no, conversation no, no. What, about withdrawing the case in he court held. What he says, what he says that no work, no pay was not discussed. That's what he said. He didn't yeah. say, he said, he said one of the issues, mm -hmm. not the issue, it's one of the issues. Yeah, but it so isn't it the, the main the issue? issue that... At this point... No, what I was saying was that the, the issue of no work, no pay yeah. was what was raised by the resident. That is the only factor. And the Minister of Labor, the minister says that... They cannot say no work, no pay, but that no doctors will be, uh, no resident doctors that participated will be, be victimized. Yeah, and that but, is, the, there is no ordinary meaning, in my opinion, that no doctor or nobody who participated will be victimized. And I believe that that is inclusive of the fact that they have to be paid, um, you know, the, the, the whatever is due to them. Well, with due respect to what you believe, but the NRD don't, they're not on the same page with you on this particular matter because they, they feel that, um, look, if the government doesn't withdraw that case in court, on what basis then are they going to continue the conversation because they feel that if that case goes against them, government will implement that matter. So isn't that supposed to be what the government should equally do such that the NARD can then feel that, okay, well, yeah, we have every reason now to call off the strike. Well, that is the, the element of, that's the component where we have to interface with the Honorable Minister of Labor. Uh, but in my opinion, if the government does um, its own bit, there should be no reason why resident doctors will not go back to work. They are not happy that they have not gone back to work. They are not happy that the Nigerians are suffering unnecessarily. We are not happy that this strike is avoidable. They are not happy that um, issue, when issues are raised, implementation becomes a problem. And we need to know why it is so, because I really don't understand. If we, um, I mean, like this uh, meeting we had, if the president orders that this should be resolved, why should anybody drag his feet or her feet in the implementation? That is the issue. And we need to find out why. For instance, when we say there is brain drain, the question is, what has the Federal Minister of Health done to even find out the factors responsible for the brain drain? And as I'm talking to you today, there will be some interviews today in... Uh, in, in uh, I think either in Sheraton or one of these uh, hotels, from people coming from Saudi Arabia to come and recruit our doctors, very well-trained doctors, so that they can go and work for them. It is Why clear, really. Why to allow that to happen? I, I think some of the reasons you know, people have to, or I doctors, expect... uh, pardon me, I think it's clear, really, for some of them, it's um, the working conditions, the incessant strikes, the, uh, the kind of facilities we have, some of them will say government's attitude to healthcare and the rest. So we know these things, as it were. So I'm not sure if there's a need to co commission some sort of research into it. It is clear. I mean, we no, can no, tell no, you no, for no. free, as it were. It, it is, uh, but, it, but the it, question it is, not is, clear. it's not clear. You have it, it, those are speculations. Interesting. See, uh, uh, well, these are things that are clear. The doctors themselves about, say the it. We speak face. to doctors. Uh, and they say it. But let me just put in this question. So you said that government needs to do what is right, and you said that consistently. You have been 
in government, as it were. I mean, you were a former head of NIMA. So you understand how government operates, at least the head of a government agency. Let me just put it that way. So you understand how government operates. So when you say that government needs to do its part, who in government? Who has been sleeping? Let us know these facts. So at least we know where to focus on because government sounds very huge. Government is made up of different moving parts, or sometimes sleeping parts. So which of them needs to work? But you, uh, you see, when you say that, um, you are saying that I should name the, is it the officer or the ministry? Because the, the, the doctors are under the Ministry of Health, not even under the Ministry of, of Labor. What labor does is to arbitrate. But the Ministry of Health should do its job. That is what we are saying. And not only that, okay, the circular written from the head the office or the head of service, why should it suddenly come out to say that a house officer and the NYSC doctor will be, be removed out of, I mean, from a scheme of service. What has necessitated that? A houseman is known from history. It has culture, it has history. Why do you have to create problems for, for where there is no problem? Why? A house officer is, I mean, a, 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 an NYSC doctor is a fully registered practicing as a practicing uh, license to, to to practice medicine a houseman by law must spend 12 months in the hospital after graduating houseman is not a student houseman is a doctor and has temporary registration so why what what is it that has brought this from the head of office or the head of service what do they want to do who do they want to help Whose interests are they protecting? Or a case of, we say a case of uh, Yanga, uh, trouble they sleep and Yanga they can't wake up. Should we say that? So, Prof. We, so, these are from, some from, of the from, factors. From what Secular we just heard you say now. Out anyhow. From, from what we just heard you say now, and in order not to misquote you, you're suggesting or saying categorically that the Ministry of Health is not doing its job, and perhaps that's why this is lingering. Well, I would say that they should do better, because otherwise, there is no reason why this... And, of course, you know that the Ministry of Health does not pay money. But they have to create the, the, the process so that people are paid their money. Because nobody, I don't think any house officer or a resident doctor will go to finance and they will listen to the person or IPPIS. So the process must start from the Ministry of Health. And then, of course, as it goes on, if it goes to finance, finance should do its job. If we, and they, of course, finance in this case also includes IPPIS. Everybody should do its job. I think once that is done, we shouldn't have any problem. But we keep on going forward and backwards. So the reason why I have said that is not enough to just hear one person say this. No, we must document this. And by percentage, by gravity, by magnitude. It's not enough to say, somebody say, uh, this is why we are doing this. No. It is left, for, and it's not just knowing, the solution must be found. Hmm. We must um, find the solution. We cannot just wish it away. And the only way, in my opinion, that this can be properly trashed out is a round table. We must discuss among ourselves. Why is it like this? In 1978, doctors left. In 1991, 92, Saudi Arabia was, the, was the, the destination, and now doctors are going to Europe, America, Saudi Arabia, everywhere in this, in, the, in this world. And they are accepted very easily because they are well trained. Mm. Nigerian doctors are very well trained. Well, and therefore, I, anywhere they go, they are, they are easily, easily employed. You know, add to that the fact that government but officials also to travel do the abroad best so that we don't uh, to get health care service. Uh, but I'd like you to tell Nigerians, Prof, uh, help them understand, because you were at that round table you know, that, that just happened, did you get a sense of urgency? Because a lot of Nigerians today don't even know where to turn to for health care because where they usually go to, uh, you know, the government institutions are really not operating as they ought to. They just focus on emergency and they have to refer and turn back a lot of cases. I, I can't count how many people have probably passed on as a result of this. So did, did you sense that sense of urgency, 
during the proceedings, the talks and the rest. Did you sense it? Well, it is very, very sad that many of our, our, our people are suffering as a result of this strike. And we, we, we are not happy about it at all. As to the sense of urgency, I tell you, we met on, on Friday from about 2 o'clock to about one, 12 midnight. We didn't finish. We started again on Saturday from 10 a.m. to again about 10, 11. Again, to be able to resolve this, that we will, everybody, the resident doctors will go back to work. So there is clearly a sense of urgency. But the problem is that why do we have to wait until there is strike before there is urgency? That is the problem. Why, if we had done this in probably uh, after the first strike, and we do not want to hear the word strike. It shouldn't be. But somebody is stimulating the strike. I don't know whether the um, instrument in government feels that it's only during this, after the strike is declared, that they will do what is normally expected them to do. I think that is the problem we are facing. So the sense of urgency is there. As you know, doctors are trained on emergencies. And we feel very sad. And we discussed it. People are suffering. And this is totally avoidable. And I am saying that on the directive of Mr. President, for whom we are very grateful, the people responsible must do their job. They should do their job so that in the end, we reduce the suffering of our people. We are pained. As the president of Nigeria Medical Association, I am very pained. And I'm sure that my colleagues in medicine are pained. That All right, Prof, we, we need to wrap up to now. Um, so j just a very quick effect. one, Prof, before we go. Um, will you or have you, as uh, president of NMA, uh, would seek audience with the Minister of Labor, perhaps on the sidelines, and perhaps prevail on him or at least try and see reasons why that case should be withdrawn because that's one of the reasons why the doctors feel that no. We, we can't because they think that some of them are still being victimized. Well, Chamberlain, let me inform you that before I was, I was one who um, escalate, I mean, um, cultivate this uh, meeting. What, what I did was to go to the minister to say that we need to discuss it because once the case was in court, he was not going to see the resident doctors anymore. And as the president of NME, I cannot sit down watching Nigerians suffer unnecessarily. So I went to him with uh, my secretary general to, to discuss with him the need for us to meet. And um, so I can resolve this issue. But the beauty is that there was higher order. The Mr. President ordered that we must meet and resolve this issue. So I'll go back to him so that um, we can discuss um, again, how we can easily wrap up this today and hopefully the resident doctor should go back as soon as all the contending issues are resolved. And I believe that it is possible. Yeah, but Prof, have you also heard that because the doctors tell us uh, off the camera that the no work, no pay rule is being implemented? Well, uh, I, I don't, that, that's one of the reasons why they did not sign the, the, the memorandum of understanding. Um, I, 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 I have to verify that. I have to go to the minister to discuss that with him because I, I cannot say this here at the moment because I don't have full information on that. So, Prof, in other words, as president of NMA, you do not have information as to whether or not your members are being... I mean, this no work, no pay is being implemented. Even till now, you, you have no information no, no, whatsoever I, about it. No, no. I, I think that statement is, is not appropriate. Nobody has been paid for August salary yet. I, I don't know. I don't know whether you have heard what, anybody... What part of it is not appropriate? Uh, that the no work, no pay rule is being August. implemented and I saw they so didn't sign the MOU? Sorry. What, what part is not that? appropriate? that the no work, no pay rule is being implemented no, no. or not? No, no, you, no, no you, you are saying that I, as the president, do not, do not know. And I'm telling you that until 
the uh, salary of August is paid and their names are not there, then that is where we will confirm that they are Im uh, implementing no work, no pay. Yeah, but you just said Otherwise, you would go and get information from there. No, but you just said you, have got, you, have, you had to get information. That's what you just said. Of course, I need to go and get information. That means that you don't have, have the information. They, have they paid salaries for August? All right, Prof, we, we, we're out of time on this. But we do hope that at the end of the day that uh, they can agree and let the doctors go back to work because we're getting messages that different units in different hospitals are shutting down because the doctors are leaving for, you just mentioned, part of the Saudi Arabia, among several others, including PLAB, which the exams that they had to pay of about 400,000 naira for to take. But we hope that all of this will be sorted. We do thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Innocent Oja, President of the Nigerian Medical Association. Well, thank you very much. It's my prayer that this will come to an end very quickly so that doctors will start work again. And uh, we want to right. plead with the workers, uh, the, the government side, that they must listen to the directive of the Mr. President and All implement right. this we very quickly. We will be back thank in you. a moment. Stay with us. resident doctors still absent from government-owned hospitals. The bulk of doctors available for clinical services are the consultants and things are generally not the same. Services at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital and the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital are still low. At the Federal Medical Center, Kefi, Nasarawa State, where 60% of its medical staff are the resident doctors, services are rendered, though not optimal. The house is paying more attention to emergencies but with limitations. Patients with severe conditions are seeking medical care in private facilities. Consultants have been quite compliant in terms of trying to really um, go out of their way to see uh, patients. They've been seeing patients and um, it's quite stressful on them. I've gone around this morning they're actually working, but um, still sympathetic over the whole issue. And more frustration from patients despite these efforts. The patient you are turning in, go come back tomorrow. You don't know eventually what will happen. The situation is the same at the state-owned Del Hatu Arab Specialist Hospital, also in Lafia. <laughs> Services are not at the usual pace. Presently, the hospital is not admitting patients hence the empty wards. At least we are maintaining some function in terms of services, even though it is not to the scale when they are present. The national strike is an opportunity for resident doctors in the state to also drive home their demands. It's not just about what the national is fighting for. We also have our own local struggles too in the state. While the national achieve theirs, we should also try and achieve ours while we try to see how we can layers with our government and ensure that um, what we're supposed to get, we'll get it from them. Here in FMC and Nguwa by Elsa State, I'm not aware of any register that has been opened. And we hope that the federal government does the needful because that's not the way to go. Compliance to the industrial action is at its high at the Federal Medical Center in our Undo State. Healthcare service is at its lowest with the wards almost empty. It appears that the striking resident doctors are not willing to back down. And this is a sign that the action of the doctors may last longer than expected.
Welcome back. Julian Ojebo joins us next. He is the Chairman, Communique and Communications for the NARD and immediate past Vice President of the NARD. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, it's, it's uh, a situation Nigerians just wish has been confined to somewhere in history. But as it is today, the NARD, uh, unless it has changed, have not signed the MOU. You're saying uh, questions about victimization, implementation of certain things. So let's hear directly from you now. What is the current situation? Um, thank you. Good morning, um, Chamberlain. Um, good morning, Nigerians. Um, I want to start by saying um, we give praise to um, the Almighty God for life that he has given to us. Um, that said, um, moving forward, uh, we're on day 22 of our strike. And as it stands at this very moment, um, nobody has called us for any meeting. Nobody. Not the Minister of Health, not the Minister of Labor. At the instance of the President, where the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria gave a directive that all technicalities surrounding the strike action should be resolved. At that instance, the um, Minister of Labor called for a meeting um, between himself and the Nigeria Medical Association. Now, the, the key word there is technicalities. What are the technical issues that made the memorandum of action to fail? Okay. And now, the NARD, being a very um, law-abiding um, association, went to the meeting to proffer key information to the Nigerian Medical Association because the uh, president um, requested that we come. So we were not officially invited to that meeting. But because of our, um, our kind, kind disposure, to ensuring that all these issues are solved, we went and um, a memorandum of action was to be signed by the Nigerian Medical Association. And we said there are two prongs to these things, okay? Number one is that um, the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors has been taken to court by the Ministry of Labor. At that meeting, we made it clear to them that they should tell the Ministry of Labor to take the case out of court if they want us to have any meaningful input to these issues. But they also alleged that um, the meeting was not between NAD and the Ministry of Labor, that the, the meeting was convoked for the Ministry of Labor, gov a government side involving um, Ministry of Health, um, uh, Budget Office, um, National Salary Incomes Wages Commission, um, the uh, um, Office of the Head of Service of the Federation that was uh, represented by, the, um, by, the, by a permanent secretary. Okay, um, then it's metamorphosed into the full-fledged meeting that um, you actually carried out and you saw. Now, we only made a prayer or two prayers. Number one prayer, kindly remove the case from the courts we will sign. Two, before we sign, what is the status of the no work, no pay? Because for work done, you have not paid. And you're saying for work not done, you're also not going to pay. The minister said it himself two weeks ago. The minister reiterated in the meeting on Friday that he had already instituted the um, no work, no pay two weeks ago. The permanent secretary of health we echoed that same thing and said, no work, no pay has been instituted. And we said, you have not paid for the ones we've done. That is the reason why we're on strike. And you're talking that you are now not going to pay for the work not done. And we said, it doesn't correlate. Pay us for the work we have done. And then we go back to work. The reason why we're on strike, we are not on strike for added allowances. We are not on strike for um, any other thing. We are on strike 
for our normal due salaries that you have not paid for January till July for some people. So it's ranging between one month to seven months. We are talking about our salary shortfalls that you have not paid from 2014 to 2016. We're talking about our bonus you have not paid for our medical residency training program. These are the issues on the table. And these issues have not been resolved. Well, Dr. So Jebo, at that instance, there was not a closed door. Yeah, pardon me about that. Could you go, was, go ahead and conclude yeah. that uh, point about the closed door meeting? Yeah, at that point, there was not a closed door meeting between um, the top echelon of the leadership um, of the enemy, NARD, and um, the minister. Now, we made it also clear there that the minister has invoked the no work, no pay. If the minister can categorically tell the table that the non-victimization clause as included in the memorandum of action, that is the only time the NARD can put pen to paper before going to meet the National Executive Council, which is the highest regulatory body of the NARD. Mind you, Chamberlain, the decision to embark on the strike was not done by the National Officers Committee. It was a unanimous decision by the National Executive Council, and only the National Executive Council can call off that industrial dispute. Yeah, well, you, you might have been in the green room while we were speaking with the uh, president of NMA, and we didn't ask him that question as well, if he was aware of all of these matters. And but I'm sure you heard his response about, well, he'll have to get information about that. But you are now telling us that there was a meeting between NERD, the NMA, and he... So, in other words, are you saying categorically that he is actually aware of all of these cases that you have brought up, including the one we did ask him, of which he said he was going to get information for? Chamberlain, I put it categorically clear that everybody is aware. Everybody is aware. I think we're just playing politics with, with Nigerians and the lives of Nigerians. I think we're playing politics. We should all be open to discussing these issues dispassionately. Okay? You tell us to come and sign a memorandum of action. We have signed a memorandum of action. We have signed a memorandum of terms of settlement. We've come back again. We've signed another memorandum of understanding. We've signed another memorandum of action. And nothing is being done. The thing is, all the memorandums we've been signing... The, the baseline is that they are not legally binding. So the government can decide to um, go whichever way it wants. Okay, so what we've now recovered or understood is that for any dispute you engage in, you should ensure that you see it to um, fruition. Because if you don't see it to fruition, in our own case, the alerts of a salaries, the alerts of a salary shortfalls, the alerts of a um, 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 a medical residency training funding, these are the only actionable plans that can actually make us sign any memorandum of agreement or terms. Other uh, than doctor. this, I don't think we are being, um, we are being fair. Okay, in other words, I don't think we are saying, being fair. Right, so you're saying you're holding off uh, from signing this MOU because, or you, you will not sign, rather, until the uh, salary for January to July is paid the shortfall from 2014 to 2016 and that particular training fee is paid. Is that what you're saying? Yes, crystal clear. Crystal okay, clear. So, so the talk about you not being, uh, uh, you know, you not being happy about victimization and the rest, that's why you're not signing, that's not the case, right? No. Now, don't, 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 twist, don't twist it. I said, Please enlighten the us. president would not put pen to paper, the president of the NARD would not put pen to paper to any memorandum of understanding. He does not have the right. He doesn't. The only body constitutionally sanctioned to stop the industrial action at, it, at the moment is the National Executive Council. And the National Executive Council, sitting in Umwahia, made it clear that because of government's failure 
to pay these monies over time, accrued over time, the Nigerian Assembly resident doctors can no longer continue in the stress and pain they have made their members to go through. So they said that only an alert would make them go back to work. Someone has worked for seven months. Someone has worked for four months. Imagine a, youth, a, a, house, a young house officer just graduating from the university has bills to pay and you've not given, given him his emolument for one to four months and then somebody say 114 is just some Mm. I think that is painful, to say the least. And it's really sad, but I just want to get and understand the this. value of this MOU that the NMA and you know, other government representatives signed and, Labor and, and the NARD says, well, we're not going to sign. I want to understand the value of it or the importance of it. I hope you get me. Yeah, 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 I do. I do. I do get you. Now, yeah, so, so, so this particular MOU, not talking the about the Republic. previous MOA or the MOTOS and the other ones. Yeah. I'm talking about the recent one, the latest one over the weekend. So what is the state? Are you, you're not going to sign it at all until those monies are paid, you go back to work and then you can start talking about it? Or what, what, what is the thinking around that particular MOU? That's what I want to know. The MOU is a memorandum of understanding. Whether we understand is now left to us the National Executive Council. The president understood at that table a memorandum of understanding. He understood what the government was saying. But the National Executive, Executive Council does not understand what they're saying. The only language they understand is that they've not been paid their salaries. The only language they understand is that their medical residency training funding has not been paid. So the only language that you the, understand is that they have salary shortfalls from 2014 to 2016. So is it that the president that of the NARD, pardon me, is it that the president of the NARD could not communicate his understanding to the neck such that they can also understand or we're just choosing not to understand? No, don't put it that way, that we are not choosing not to understand. We are, not choosing, not, we are choosing not to understand because we don't understand the rationale why Payments of salaries to be held for seven months. We do not understand why somebody that is sitting in a particular office cannot do his job. Well, I have done my job. That is what we cannot understand. We can understand you telling us that this is what we will do, this is what we will do, this is what we will do. But the person that has not been paid cannot understand that fact. The person that has lost his loved one and has not gotten his debt in benefit service does not understand that part. So that is what we are saying. The president understands with them, fine and clear. It's a table. You've told him, he has, he's understood what you have said. He has to take what he has understood to the National Executive Council. Okay, just to be clear that to Nigeria, when we say president, we're referring to the president of NARD, not the president of the Nigeria. The president of the NARD. Oh, yeah. Of course. So, so let, let, let's talk about this meeting. So if you say that the NARD was not invited officially, as you're always invited to meetings, so it was sort of a, I don't know, a tag along or a verbal invite. Uh, can the enemy, just help me understand, Nigerians understand, can the enemy sign or make decisions on behalf of the NARD and say, okay, well, because NARD is an affiliate body, we're going to say, okay, fine, let's sign the dotted lines and we'll communicate NARD and all will be well. Is that possible? No, it's not possible. The Nigerian Medical Association is the parent body of all doctors in the country. The NARD is the association that caters for the welfare of all resident doctors in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, okay? The NARD is made up of adults who understand simple English, okay? The NMA can only make a plea to the Nigerian Assembly of Resident Doctors that from our understanding, this is what the government has done, these are the um, hitches that they're having, these are the hitches they are having, Okay, and then we will now make our own informed decision by ourselves. If I want to go, for, go in for surgery, I will sign with my own hands the consent that I understand everything that will be done on me. Okay, now, if you are owing me 
and I've gone on strike. You're calling my father to come and speak to me. I'll listen to my father. Hear what he wants to say. But I'll also tell him that, Dad, these are the issues. One, two, three, four, five. If these issues have not been done, we have no reason to combat and discuss all of these issues. Do we listen to our, our parents? Of course, yes. But we also have our own needs. We also have our own um, mental space, as it were, to process all of these things. So when in the, in the absence of understanding these things, we, we think that there, there'll be a problem. Okay, so we listen to the enemy. We've always listened to them, but we have sp specific demands. We're impoverished, as it were. Over 2,000 of our members, over 2,000, have not been paid for, one, uh, for um, three to four months. Over 114, 114 of our house officers have not been paid. 19 of our members lost their lives and their debts and benefits have um, um, Insurance has not been paid. Over 6,000 of our members have been owed salary shortfall, paid less than 62% of the salaries between 2014 and 20, um, 2017. They've accrued debts over the time. How do you want them to understand? I think our parent body, the enemy, now needs to make us understand because we don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. Have you asked yourself, just for once, where is the minister for health? Where is the Minister for Health? Nobody has asked that question. Have you seen him in any conciliatory meeting? The only Why time he came for a conciliatory meeting, he said, and I quote, that he was going for a press briefing for the Presidential Steering Committee. It means that there's nobody supervising the Ministry of Health. Why do you think the that's the case? Instance, our issues... Why, why, do you think the, you. why do you think the minister is not there? Chamberlain, I think you should be telling me, because I don't know. We don't know. We I'm not the president of NRD. You are NRD on a lighter note. But do you get a sense that uh, the authorities feel they can get across to the NMA, uh, perhaps if they get the NMA, NMA can get the NARD to listen, hence why they invited the NMA, who then beckoned on the NARD to come for the meeting and perhaps sign the MOU. <laughs> Chamberlain, I have three children. If my kids ask me for ice cream, I'm standing right by the fridge. They're standing close to me. I'll give them the ice cream. I don't need to tell their mother, tell them to go and tell their mother to come and take the ice cream from the fridge or now tell them the complaints that they need. It doesn't make any sense. You're only resident doctors. Pay the resident doctors. Why, why go round and round? You know, doctor, and, and for a lot of Nigerians, that has been... The simple question, how hard is it? Uh, I mean, you just put it simply, you're owing resident doctors, pay resident doctors. We've heard government side as well. But I think uh, part of this conversation that we need you to also clear for us, yes, you've referenced the Minister of Health, but help us understand at whose table these issues need to be resolved. Professor Oja earlier mentioned that right after that MOA was signed, some people went to sleep. So maybe you also know those people that went to sleep or those departments, agencies, ministries that went to sleep. So at least maybe Nigerians can rally around and wake them up. So help us know, please. It's, um, it's basically three um, um, MDAs. The Ministry of Health, um, Office of the Head of Service of the Federation, and the Budget Office, or let's say the Ministry of Finance. These are the three ingredients to all of the quagmire we have. These three. Persons in the Office of the Ministry of Health are not doing their job. We've always argued the hospitals in the first place have no reason being under hospital services. They need to be in the Department of Planning and Policy. 
because there is no proper planning, there is no proper policy, we keep having these issues. There is no projection. That's why we have these issues. Now, when there are projections, it's moved from the um, de um, Department of Hospital Services to Human Resources. There is a lag. There is a drag. They are not doing their jobs. It moves from um, Human Resources to Ministry of Finance. They are not doing their job. The obnoxious circular that was released by the Office of the Head of um, the Civil Service of the Federation, who apparently is also a doctor, Secular, we do not understand where it's coming from, the imports, the economical importance, the policy importance, we do not understand. It emanated from the office of the head of the service of the Federation. So these are the key offices that are giving us the problems we have right now. So we're telling Nigerians, and we want Nigerians to know, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance, and the office of the head of service to the Federation. I was hoping there would be more. This is where we have our issues. Okay, maybe more specificity, but as it were, you, you, you've, you've at least mentioned those areas. So some dailies, I mean, you see some headlines saying strike to end soon, especially now that there's, a, there's an MOU, and for them, they're just waiting for the NARD to sign the dotted lines. Is that true? Will this strike end soon? <laughs> um, that's you putting me on the spot. Okay, but I'll try and give you an answer as a Nigerian doctor. You have not paid me and you're telling me I'm going to call off the strike soon. If you pay me today, I'll call off the strike today. If you pay me as I'm leaving the studio, I'll call off the strike today. Why am I sitting at home doing nothing? The only reason I'm going to stay at home is that I've not been paid. That's the only reason I'm staying at home. So when you say very soon, very soon translates to the doctors getting... They are due salaries. Come on, for God's sakes. We're talking about salaries. We're not talking about any other thing. Salaries. Just salaries. Seven months, six months, five months, four months. It's painful. All right, uh, Dr. Julian Ojebo, Chairman, Communications and Communicate of NARD. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you very much, Amberlin. We're back in a moment and talk on another equally important matter. So, just stay with us. We have security incidents and the immediate, you know, results. Kidnapping, killings, destruction and the rest. But there's also the ripple effect, as you've seen in Plateau, the curfew that was imposed as a result of the gruesome killing of those travelers. And it's not just in Plateau states. Take Katsina, for example, 12 people were killed over the weekend. In Kaduna State as well, 12 people were killed over the weekend from Saturday to Sunday. So imagine, sadly, people killed. And then the ripple effect on the economy, on so many things. It's, it's a big conversation, but perhaps a silver line as well. Uh, the return of some of the abducted students of Bethel Secondary School. So much to discuss in this. And we have joining us, as you may have seen, Colonel Francis Okoson, who's a former military officer and a security consultant. He joins us from Papa here in Lagos. Good to have you on the program. Perhaps we should begin with some, some good news, as it were. Mixed feelings, though. Uh, the release of uh, the 15, or return, I should say, 15 uh, students that were kidnapped at Bethel Baptist School. Uh, 63 of them still remain in captivity. And I imagine a lot of Nigerians, you know, going through the news this morning, watching us, and they're asking, for how long would we have to still be discussing this? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, for how long are we going to continue to discuss this? We, we will continue to discuss this for as long as the basic things are not done. You see, this is my take. We have a country that is supposed to be marked out, delineated, and allocated to certain security agencies to take care of. And I would not hesitate to call out the Nigeria Police and the Department of State Service. There are 774 local governments in Nigeria. Every single inch of that ground is forced under the responsibility of one DPO, 
of some commander of the DSS. Now, if anything goes wrong within their areas of responsibility, they ought to be held accountable. So take the Plateau incident, for example. Oughtn't we have had a commander, that is to say the DSS of police, that is proactive enough, prognostic enough to interpret indicators and then come up with prognosis. This is what we expect will happen. And then feed this to the relevant agencies. Until we are able to do this, we are going to keep coming back to discuss this same issue. So let's build on that. I think it's quite important uh, uh, the, the, the talk about responsibility and ensuring that if people don't you know, keep up to their responsibilities, there are meant to be repercussions that is well. So for local governments, because so far these attacks we see, we see them in rural areas, areas that are not as urban as, 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 as you know, a place like Ikeja in Lagos, for example. So for a local government or a rural area, a community, which security agents and agencies are responsible. So let's come to the smallest a local government area, the police, the DSS, the NSCDC, who are meant to be manning those areas? You just answered your own question. In every local government, you have a DSS officer. In every local government, there's some DPO or the other responsible either in an overlapping manner or in an exclusive uh, 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 definition. Therefore, the DSS officer in, say, a Southwest local government where I hail from, he should be able to account for what happens in that geographical configuration. If he's unable to, then he's either removed or made to account for his lapses. The police, the DSS, they are the ones down to the grassroots. Look, it, it's a very, I'm sorry, I'm, if I sound simplistic, it's very simple, it's very, very simple. If you have a DSS officer in a Papa local government, for example, and you have the kind of mayhem and gridlock and madness that we have in a Papa, and nothing has been done in terms of analysis, indication of, I mean, uh, interpretation of indicators to higher headquarters or higher authorities for them to sort, for example, their Papa gridlock, uh, sort out their Papa gridlock, then somebody is sleeping. And that person ought to be removed there or made to account for what's happening. The local government is the responsibility of these, these organizations that I have detailed about. Again, on the program, we hear that somebody is sleeping. I mean, that's twice already we've heard that in the health sector, now in the security sector. And... Maybe it's simplistic to ask that. Who is meant to wake these people up because their sleep is costing lives? It's costing the future of children. Imagine thousands of children kidnapped just in the space of one year in Nigeria. So uh, perhaps that's a conversation we need to have. But help us understand or situate the recent attacks we're seeing. Because, I mean, the recent one in Katsina and Kaduna states, 12 people killed in Katsina 12 people killed in Kaduna between Saturday and Sunday. So help Nigerians understand what is at play here because you will hear that different things are at play when it comes to security in Nigeria. But for the Katsina killing and the Kaduna killings, what is at play? See, whatever is at play is something that someone is paid to identify, isolate, and interpret. You see, you can't sit there in the studio, no, I sit in my office here and give you the specific details of what happened in Plateau or Katsina or any other state. But suffice to say that in Basa, local government of Plateau State, the officer who is responsible for that ground ought to have assets, sources, agencies, informants, and if you like some technical uh, uh, input or assets to be able to interpret indicators. There, look, there are indicators, this is just don't drop. There are indicators that must be identified and interpreted. And once these are identified and, and interpreted, then the result, which is now 
intelligence is fed to the customer. The customer in this instance would be... Mm. It is those indications... Uh, it is those indications I refer to because what plays out in Katsina is definitely different from what is playing out in Kaduna. Some will tell you in Kaduna it's, uh, you know, communal clashes, ethnic clashes, attacks, and reprisals. And they tell you in Katsina, oh, it's something entirely different, banditry as a result of, is it mining and the rest. Which is why I ask, I, I believe you've been following some of his indications and projections, just so that Nigerians can understand what is at play in the different theatres of war, as it were, in this country. Okay. In each instance, these things take place or happen in time and space. Someone is paid to monitor this space and the time frame. Therefore, it is these persons or this person that ought to know. Look, the Mani Casina has a different set of factors from the guy in Plateau or the guy in um, Lagos, for example. Each is trained to assess, it is, it is intelligence assessment, it's intelligence estimate that you come up with when you consider these factors. Look, I'm not going to be drawn into the politics of what is different between Casina and Plateau or Lagos, but it is true that whatever these inter, uh, uh, intervening factors are, the bottom line is that there is insecurity, there is death, there is bloodshed, there is mayhem. So how do you avert this? You avert this by making sure that timely information is obtained, it is processed, it is sieved, it is assessed, and then you get intelligence out of it. As it is, intelligence is not, is not readily available because somebody is sleeping. So wait, is it really possible that, you know, in the case of, uh, say, an intelligence officer who is assigned to a local government to just be there and not gather intelligence? Or could it be that they actually do get intelligence, pass it on, which is what they can do, just get it and pass it on? But you think that they are there, but they are not doing their job. How can you say that for sure? Chamberlain, if they were there, they assessed the situation, they interpreted indicators, and they got intelligence and passed on to higher headquarters. And higher headquarters did nothing. What have they done or what did they do at the lower echelon? What did they do? You see, it is the truth is that there is no theater. I'm talking now the operations. There is no operational commander, police or army, that would not succeed with valuable information. However, given that he has the resources to execute these, uh, these tasks. But if he has actionable intelligence, which he doesn't produce, he's a customer, he's a consumer of intelligence. If he has actionable intelligence, which is provided him, he will do better. Okay, mark my words, he will do better. That is, do better than we currently are seeing. Yeah, but well, when you say that uh, if that was done uh, and he's there, what did he do? What's, what's your thinking? What should he have done or what should he do? is responsible to a higher authority. Every officer has a level above them that they will report to. And when you report to the higher, you can copy. You can copy an even higher wrong. As somebody on the next wrong, you have an action address and you have an information address. You do this long enough and you have your own copies. You do this long enough. So something breaks, something bursts. Something, something untoward happens to your area. You can say, sir, I did this, I did B, I did C. I advised like this, I informed that person, nothing was done about it. If anything was done, well, it wasn't obvious to people. See, Chamberlain, let me, let me, give, you, let me give you an example of what is going to, what, is, what could happen. Did you see the traffic gridlock in Ababa? It is an accident waiting to happen. Take Take the, take the problem in Ababa, take the traffic situation in Ababa. People are seeing just tankers and trailers on bridges and gridlock and all that. Have you considered the possibility of some, 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 somebody who has evil intention taking advantage of that confusion in Ababa? Has anybody ever thought of that? Look at the number of trailers. Look at the tank farms in Ababa. You have an active naval base with warships, with 
bombs and armaments and all that. You have the 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 my two uh, my two ocean. You have the my two Badagri road, and you have this number of tank farms. All it takes, all is all it takes for for a conflagration is for one Kenya cigarette smoker to dispose his matchstick. Boom. One tanker goes on fire, and the whole place. Look, Dante Inferno will be a child's play, and then we back to assessing. Oh, what, what, what ought to have been? What should have been? Who did what? You know, no, come on now. We look at problems in the face, and we refuse to address them. That is what has got us where we are, and that is what's going to persist unless we determine to deal with this thing holistically. They're saying that challenges are first of all local. We understand that. So from, from a papa to this larger security challenge that we face in the country, I mean, today, you hear the resident doctors say that they feel that they are being victimized. So in the case, the example which you highlighted, where you feel if a lower officer in operations feel they gather information, it's not being actioned, then acted upon, then they should escalate the matter. So what do they do in this case, especially if they feel, look, I might have tried it before, or I've seen people who have tried it, and they have been victimized, and at the end of the day, they fall for it. So what would they do? What would you advise to do, being mindful of perhaps their understanding of what they've seen happen in the country? Um, Chamberlain, there are back channels that you can use in every instance. A security officer or a security operative is aware of these back channels. These back channels can be used, have been used, ought to be used, and must be used or else will remain in this bad man. That's as much as I, can, as I can say. Because every intelligence operative is aware that there is a back channel. Such back channels can be used. Do you think some people somewhere just want to have their way no matter what happens or get certain things done irrespective of what people think? Because if you keep saying people are aware, they know what they should do, then one wonders why are they not doing it? Chamberlain, you are in Nigeria just like I am. You are in Nigeria just as I am in Nigeria. It pains me. You see, it pains to see kids are left back in the army drawing fire the way they do. It's, 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 it's a blooming pity that we have a situation on our hands that we ought to handle differently. And I'm talking about from the local to the federal. I am not going to put this at the doorstep of just one, one level. Every single level of it is guilty of ineptitude, is guilty of complacency, is guilty of I don't know. We can do better, Chamberlain. We can do better. So when you say every level, uh, I imagine you mean every level of government and perhaps people yes, as sir. well. Yes, there's, yes, there's always, yes, there's, there's always a talk about states, how states play in all of this. You hear state governors say, we're chief logistics officers. They say, well, you're chief security officers. And then the president tells governors, go and secure your states. Isn't that why you campaigned in the first place? So uh, let's maybe talk about the role of states, if we can, briefly. What should states, and I mean state governors, be doing? We've heard some of them saying to people, arm yourselves or at least defend yourselves. Let me be clear about that. So what should states be doing really in this, in the context of the laws we have and the realities? As things stand, the states have not been able to do as they ought to, to, to have done. They probably are incapable. Or Look, listen, um, it gets down to individuals taking their destinies in their hands. In the Edo State, Edo Central Senatorial District, for example, there is a self-effort that has just been uh, 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 initiated. They call it the Atanapa. It is the ASA Solidarity Forum deciding that, determining that they can no longer cope with what is happening. People can no longer go to farms, People can travel on market days from one village to the other, kidnapping, ransom collecting, and all that. So they came up with the ASA Solidarity Forum. Now, 
Minds like retired uh, Vice Marshal Anthony Okwere, retired General Cecilia Sekai, Dr. Dori Okoji, and so on, came together and they mobilized support from sons and daughters of the Centurial Zone. And I think only last week or so, they launched this Atanaka thing with vehicles and um, uh, vigilantes and motorcycles and uh, walkie talkies and so on and so forth to go into the forest because they own the ground. They know the territory better than anybody else. Go into the forest and act as first intelligence, I mean, uh, uh, information gatherers that they can pass on to state agents or agencies for them to, from then on, act. If we can have every state government, as Governor Basaki is encouraging the industry, we can have every state government and every state governor toe this same line and stop the stop playing to the gallery I, I, with, with all due respect, with all due respect, most of the state governors that I see and hear are not, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not got the hang of the problem or they are pretending. They pretend, you see, it, it, it's, it's lip service most of the time. I have not had the privilege of sitting across the table with any governor. If I did or if I do, I will tell them what I believe they ought to do differently. In other words, if they put in place those measures which you just spoke about, you think it will rein in any of those persons who are usually heavily armed? It will ameliorate. See, Chamberlain, if you have, if you have a worship that costs X millions of dollars, it would take actionable intelligence for you to use an exocet, exocet missile that costs $50,000 to sink that ship. You sink that ship because you have intelligence. And get intelligence from a source or an agency. Now, if every state would have, would replicate what I just told you they are doing in ESA, wrong, in a, in a, a dose central century, for example, if every state were to encourage that, you would teach the um, the kidnapper, you will teach the abductors, you will teach the bandits, you teach them caution. I mean, teach them caution. That is it. When the man is aware that somebody is on their tail, then they will not be as brazen as they have been. These guys have just been as brazen as they have turned out because there is no deterrence. And deterrence will come in many shapes, shades and forms. That's my point. You still look, talk, you're talking about being armed. If you're around, uh, you see, but my tactics teacher taught me that you don't test the enemy's strength. You exploit his weaknesses. So we ought to learn to exploit the weaknesses of our adversaries, our enemies, and then we can, we can destabilize them. We can render them ineffective. That is the point we are making. We're not talking about, I'm sure the next one you're going to ask me, oh, well, they say they have air, air, air defense capability and all that. Yes, if they have air defense capability, where is the National Intelligence Agency, uh, Chamberlain? You have an NIA, that is the external security um, apparatus. They are the CIA that we have. When you brought down Osama bin Laden in Ab Abbottabad, it was not done by the U.S. I mean, the, the intelligence was not originated by U.S. Marines or the U.S. Army or the U.S. Air Force. It was CIA, CIA assets. So what is the NIA doing not being able to locate the, 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 the fortresses of these bandits and these kidnappers and these hoodlums in the, in the forest? What are they doing? And somebody says DG there, and the man is the man's appointment will be renewed tomorrow. And you are telling me that the man ought to end his bed. The man should not, the man is sleeping. And if he's mm. sleeping, give him venue, let him sleep at, at home. Well, I think that's a great point to anchor with that point. There should be repercussions for failure. I would like to thank you so much, uh, Colonel Francis Okosu, former military officer and a security consultant. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us on the program. Thank you so much. And you guys have a good day. Thank you. Well, let's take a look at some of the mails. Uh, we've got Olagunju oh, yeah. Oladele who sends the first one talking about uh, national security. He says, security crisis is systemic. They, that elites and politicians, create the problem and they exploit the system. Hmm, that sounds like taking advantage of the weaknesses. That's what they do to control the people. They empowered it, so it reduces their efforts to govern and provide adequate security. To defeat this, we need to punish incompetence in all security outfits. 
enough with the excuses. Well, Alexander Alassa mails on uh, resident doctor strike saying, my advice to the leadership of the medical doctors is that they should stop signing MOUs. That you have an understanding signed doesn't mean both parties have agreed and cannot be enforceable in a law court. Hence, it should be an MOA as a memorandum of agreement. Really? They signed that as well. <laughs> it goes on to say, this is an enforceable document by law, meaning both parties have understood and agreed to terms. And by saying, doctors, kindly take note of this. Well, currently, Ogulusi is still on that uh, doctor strike site. Nigerian doctors are quick to point to the remuneration of their colleagues worldwide, but will never talk about their colleagues in Nigeria who will never be present at their duty posts in the government hospitals. They are all engaged in their private practices in Nigeria. Can they do that where they are all running to after training them almost free in Nigeria? Mm. I mean, there should also be that balance as well because you have some of these uh, medical practitioners. Well, they really say, look, if they're going to pay them 3.5 million in Saudi and you're paying 400,000 right here, why would you need to do local money or the other things? Mm. I mean, round table maybe, but maybe I went out of round table. Let's just sort this out. Anthony Uday, also on Dr. Strike, says these issues can be traced as far back as 2014. Resident doctors reached an agreement with FG and signed MOU, but the government reneged on them. In 2017, we met again, signed MOTOS, a <laughs> memorandum of terms of settlement. In less than one month, FG repudiated and stopped all payments. Fast forward to 2021, we signed MOA, that's Memorandum of Action, and then an addendum to the MOA, and yet they have not fulfilled any of the promises till date. We have trusted FG for 128 days and nothing has happened. Only government sincerity will put an end to the numerous strikes. We don't need MOU, Motos, MOA anymore. We need alerts, he says. What well, Tunji Onokoya says, uh, to improve our health sector, we need to ask the basic questions. One. What is the global best practice on remuneration and condition of service for resident doctors? Are resident doctors postgraduate students or not? How many professionals have their postgraduate studentship remunerated from government coffers? What is the global best practice on the remuneration of doctors involved in the mandatory voluntary service for their country? Other professionals who are involved in compulsory post-certification qualification and training what is their condition of service. Are lawyers, pharmacists, architects, nurses, and other professionals entitled to such benefits and treatment in Nigeria? I don't know if it's that straightforward or that simple, though. I mean, with those points, it even makes it a bit more complex, but these are clearly the issues. Professor Inakena uh, says, okay, let's, let's take this last one. Government and resident doctors should come to a compromise that will allow the doctors to get paid what they are owed and return to work. Nigerians that can't uh, access the private medical services are dying in droves. Both parties must respect the sanctity of the human life and sort this ambush. Well, Allah, we also get your mail, but thank you all for your messages. Uh, we'll see you next time. I'm Chamberlain. So. I'm Kairi Okikulu to have a fantastic day ahead. <laughs>